From the story of the temptation of Adam and Eve, we learn that the tempter is one who can talk us into doing things and make a bad idea seem like a good one. We run into that tempter again in Matthew chapter 4 in the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. I encourage you to find that in the Pew Bible provided or the Bible you brought from home. Matthew chapter 4, we begin reading with the first verse through the 11th. Listen for the word of God. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Here ends our reading of God's holy word. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. I was looking around the church to put, have something to put the ashes in for Ash Wednesday. Apparently we don't have a designated bowl for that, or if so, I didn't know where it was. So I asked Allison, our office manager, and Leslie, the director of the Northside Learning Center, who has an office right next to mine, to help me. And they pitched in, and we started looking for bowls that might work. And because it's a jovial workplace, it got a little silly uh, as we showed each other bowls. Hey, wouldn't this be great? Like this bright uh, green uh, Easter egg looking thing. No, that won't work. And we were getting a little silly with it when Allison said, I can't find a bowl, but I do have a devil. And I thought, what? And she reached into a cabinet uh, in the credenza there and pulled out a devil puppet. And she explained to me that Jody Martin, when she and Joe B were here, ordered puppets and ordered a cast of characters and it came with this. And I will admit this is the first and last time I have ever used a puppet in the pulpit. I mean, look at this thing. I mean, how obvious it has a Dracula cape, bright red color, and horns on the top of his head. And the question I want to ask you, and the point I want to make is, do you really think the devil is this obvious? I don't think so. We have really typecast the tempter, haven't we? We've made the devil into a cliche. Drugs and sex and rock and roll, Las Vegas and Bourbon Street. That kind of stereotyping does little good. It's self-serving and maybe even self-righteous. It is not biblical. Satan's primary role in scripture is the one you see here is as the tempter. And the tempter is one who does more than talk us into walking on the wild side. The way the devil works is to make his agenda sound like a good idea. You'll notice in our text that 
the devil even quotes scripture. I think that's telling. Our New Testament lesson has Jesus led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted and it's immediately after his baptism that this takes place when we heard a voice from heaven, God's own voice saying, this is my son with whom I am pleased, the beloved. Then just like that, Jesus is led out to be tempted by Satan. And Satan does the tempting using the same word each time. If, if you're the son of God, do this. If you're the son of God, do that. All these I will give you if. The temptation that Christ struggles with here is a kind of identity crisis for him because Satan says to him twice, if you are the son of God, if you are who you say you are, it's a question of identity. The temptation to be someone or something else. The threefold story of Jesus' temptation doesn't attempt to cover the so called seven deadly sins of anger and envy and gluttony and greed and lust and pride and sloth. No, here the tempter is calling Jesus out and challenging him on his most basic understanding of who he is and what he is about and you call yourself the Son of God. That's what happens here to Jesus and to us. The temptation we face is a temptation to distort our faith, to forget who we are and what we are all about. Talking about this tale of temptation, Tom Long wrote, this story is about the kind of trials and testings that happen to people, to Israel, to Jesus and to the church when we're called to be God's people and to do God's work in the world. The testing of Jesus, the testings of Israel before him and the testing of the church today are not primarily temptations to do what we would really like to do but know we should not. They are t the temptations to be something other than who God calls us to be, to deny that we are God's children. You see, that's how Jesus' temptation there and then addresses our temptation here and now. This is not a generic story of temptation. This is about the temptation that we face, the unique temptation we face as followers of Jesus Christ. And so we consider this story every year at the beginning of Lent because we need to be honest about our temptations. We face the same temptations as everyone else in this secular world does. But we also face temptations that are unique to our calling as followers of Jesus Christ. You see, temptation isn't just about being bad. Rarely does the tempter approach us and say, Hey, I've got a really stupid idea. It's going to get us both in a lot of trouble and we'll regret it later. Why don't you join me? No, the tempter works by convincing us that something is good that probably really isn't. Our greatest temptation then is to misappropriate the good. That's certainly the temptation that Jesus faces here in the wilderness. The power to do good to feed his own hunger. The power to prove a point that yes, he is who God said he is. To serve something less than God. All three temptations here are temptations for Jesus to be less than who he is less than who he is and who he is called to be, less than God's beloved son. And that is our temptation as well, to be less than who we are called to be. Now for us, the temptations outlined here may not seem too familiar, 
but to the original hearers of this story, they were very familiar because the temptations that Jesus faces are the exact temptations faced by the children of Israel in the wilderness after they left Egypt. The way the story is told in Matthew underscores the fact that Jesus is undergoing exactly the same temptations. One regarding hunger, a second regarding putting God to the test, and the third regarding false worship. First, the devil tries the direct approach. Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. He's hungry, so the devil speaks to him of hunger. And what the tempter does here is to tempt Jesus to use his hunger, use his power to address his own hunger. If you are who you say you are, turn these stones into bread. Feed yourself. The logic seems sound. That's the way the tempter works. But it doesn't work with Jesus. Talking back to Satan, he refers to God's provision of daily bread. He references Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, verses, verse 3, and says, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The tempter answers that with even more temptation, and he quotes scripture to make his point. Again, he uses the word if. This time, it's a direct challenge to Jesus, saying, in effect, if you are who you say you are, the Son of God, prove it. He asks, and again, quoting from Psalm 91, talks about how God will protect his chosen one, and he dares Jesus to throw himself off the top of the temple, because Psalm 91 says the chosen one will not dash his foot against a stone and the angels will swoop in to pick him up. Go ahead, prove it. Prove that you're God. But Jesus doesn't fall for that one either. He says, quoting scripture, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Serving as a reminder that God need not prove God's self to us. What we need to believe is faith, not proof. The temptation here is to define faith on our own terms. If God measures up to my standards, then I'll believe. If God answers my questions, then I'll give faith a try. One commentator put it this way, what kind of faith doubts God at every turn and insists that God do one miracle after another? I mean, who are we to tell God what to do and how to do it? Who are we to demand signs like the Almighty is going to do tricks for us? And then that third temptation... Who does the tempter think he is? He takes Jesus up high again, and he take, probably takes his arm and makes a sweeping gesture and uses a game show announcer voice to say, all this could be yours. If, again that if, if you just bow down and worship me. <laughs> and What's so ludicrous about this is who does the devil think he is offering God the world that God created? Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. Sure, the devil is real, but let's not give him too much credit. The temptation is out there, and it's not just out there on the first Sunday in Lent. You may remember the hymn, This is My Father's World, and that great line that says, This is my Father's world, oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. God is. Now, truth be told, Israel stumbled over these very same temptations in the wilderness. 
And truth be told, again, church history will show us that we have a lot in common with the children of Israel. Like them, we've been blessed for a reason. And like them, we've struggled with what it means to be a blessing. We've given in to our temptations. The church doesn't always have the best track record. Sometimes our failings are more obvious than our successes. The world is full of people that have been burned out and burned up by the church. The good news is that we are not defined by our shortcomings, nor are we confined by them. The good news is that Jesus was tempted, but did not give in to his temptations. Our temptations do not define who we are. Our successes don't. Our shortcomings don't. Our relationship with Jesus Christ does. Our relationship with Jesus Christ does. The good news that we face in any temptation is that Christ has faced temptation and when we deal with that temptation, the best thing we can do as followers of Jesus Christ is to say, I'm with him. I'm with him. I'm with him. And to the one who dares us to follow, be all praise, honor, and glory forever. Amen.